Let's see. Tell me when I share my screen. Okay, so I'm, I'm going live now. Mm -hmm. And we have started streaming. Okay. So I will start it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's three. So we will start. Uh, welcome everyone to this new uh, new seminar of the Sussex uh, Vision Seminar Series. Uh, I am Antonio Hinojosa, a postdoc in Leon Lagnado Lab, and I'm working in, in mouse cortex. And and I'm 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 here with uh, Natalie Rochefort today. Uh, that is gonna um, that is gonna uh, tell us about her research on how behavioral context mm -hmm. modulates neural activity uh, in the in the visual cortex. So sorry. Um, so uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers of the because this talk is part of the worldwide neuro neuro initiative, uh, which was was put forward by Tim Bogles and Panos Bocelos. And this is uh, aimed at, uh, at creating talks that are greener and more accessible to all than the, the traditional uh, talks. Um, I would also like to tell you about the structure of the talk. So we will have 45 minutes uh, of, of the talk, and then we will do fi around 15 minutes of questions. And later on, uh, we will have a, a, a more relaxed discussion uh, over Zoom. So please feel free to join if you have any further question or if you would like to discuss uh, with uh, different, uh, different people uh, about the topics. And also another thing I want to remind is that if you have any question, please uh, write it in the, in the chat and uh, we will make the questions at the end of the, of the talk. Um, so um, also please join the channel if you don't want to miss any of the, of the talks that we do uh, every week uh, about visual processing. So uh, uh, here, Natalie Roxford is an associate professor at the University of Edinburgh. Um, there she started her, her, her group in 2014. So uh, during her career, she started as an undergraduate uh, in the, where she, she studied biology and epistemology at the ENS in Paris. And then she obtained an European PhD in neuroscience from the University of uh, Paris 6 and the Ruard University in Wuhan in Germany. Uh, she was supervised by Ulf Hazel and Chantal Mijeret. Uh, she then moved on to, her, to do her postdoctoral training at the Technical University in Munich uh, with Arthur Conner. And during, the, during her PhD and postdoc, her work was, uh, had contributed to a new understanding of how neurons acquire their functional properties in the visual cortex. This work also has led to the development of new in vivo two photon calcium imaging techniques in mouse. And uh, her current projects in, in the lab investigate how behavioral context modulates neuronal activity in the visual cortex. She's also uh, won various uh, prestigious uh, honors like the Bernard Katz Lecture Award and the Embojan Investigator a word. Um, yes, uh, they also also she was she's being awarded uh, the Sir Henry Dale Fellowship and uh, ERC Consolidator Grant more recently. So it's a pleasure for us to have you here, Natalie, and we are looking forward to hearing about your research. Well, thank you very much for this oral introduction. So I will share my screen here, right? Can you see it? Yeah. Yes, I can see. Okay, so today I will present a recent study from the lab investigating how energy availability impacts information coding in neocortex. 
And before diving into this topic, I would like to give a bit of context explaining how we started investigating such question. So my research group is using the um, primary visual cortex. I need to, yeah, as a model system, as a model of cortical circuit, integrating visual inputs, sensory inputs with contextual signals, such as the motor activity and as well as the past experience, meaning when a stimulus has been associated with the reward, how uh, this association changes the activity in um, neuronal populations in the primary visual cortex. And we have been studying that at different levels, the level of neuronal populations using in vivo to photon calcium imaging, as well as at the level of single neurons using 3D imaging. And uh, when studying how experience, how learning influence the activity of cortical circuits, we as uh, most of uh, other labs interested in this question, we have used uh, food or water restricted animals uh, that would be motivated. So we are, as a motivation, we are using this food or water restriction and uh, these mice uh, learn a rewarded uh, behavioral task. And then we are interested in following the changes in uh, cortical activity during the learning of this rewarded task. And while we were doing such experiments, we actually wondered whether these changes in metabolic state associated with this uh, food or water restriction was actually by itself changing um, the activity of this cortical circuit. And so as a, this was a starting point to investigate how a contextual signal linked to a metabolic change would affect the activity of cortical circuits. So starting this, uh, this uh, study, we know that information processing in the brain is metabolically expensive. This pie is comprising less than 2% of our body mass. The brain is, the human brain is actually consuming almost 20% of our total calorie intake. And uh, this uh, consumption is uh, largely due to the use of uh, to the energy spent by neurons to reverse the ion fluxes associated with electrical signaling via the, the sodium potassium ATPase. So we have a very costly uh, neuronal function and the main uh, usage of this energy is, as you can see in this pie chart, for synaptic transmission. And despite the fact that uh, the brain is metabolically expensive, the actual resources, the food av availability, the intake is highly variable. It was shown, for example, I gave here two examples in the orangutans in South America and in the stripped mouse in South Africa, just examples to show how uh, the, the, the range of which the food availability and, and intake can vary across individual seasons and sex. Here for the orangutan between the males and the females um, between January and May, and here during the dry and the moist season for the stripped mouse. So the, our question was how has the mammalian brain adapted to variations in food availability? And um, given this energetic cost of brain functions and the scarcity of resources, the brain is forth to have evolved an energy efficient coding strategy that would maximize the information transmission per unit energy. And when we speak about energy, it's we mean ATP. So that would maximize information transmission per ATP usage, unit of ATP usage. Given that this brain is energy limited, one hypothesis is thus that in times of food scarcity, neural networks should save energy by reducing this information processing. And there has been previous studies done in invertebrates um, indicating that that might be the case. So when um, clue was coming from a study in a fruit fly, where it was shown that uh, dopaminergic neurons that are involved in long-term memory formation uh, would, uh, were found to be strongly reduced in their activity 
in uh, starved flies. So during food restriction, this would strongly reduce the activity of these dopaminergic neurons, and this would have a negative impact on this uh, long-term memory score. When the authors uh, exogenously activated these neurons, there was a recovery of the memory score, but this was at the expense of survival. So basically, the fruit flies died more. Um, so this was an indication that um, memory formation is metabolically costly and that these food restrictions would impair this costly long-term memory in fly to promote survival. Another indication is coming from um, this study uh, from uh, Long Den et al, showing that food restriction would reduce again in the, in the fly the gain of the visually evoked neuronal activity during walking. So here, the activity during walking in uh, brown, in stationary in black, and in food deprived animals, this gain increase during locomotion would, be, um, would disappear. So again, as an indication that the nutri nutritional state uh, would modulate the neuronal processing of, in that case, visual information. But um, the question of uh, how these uh, changes occur or which changes occur in the mammalian brain remains largely unexplored. And that's what uh, we wanted to, to study, how the food availability would impact the energy usage and the information processing in the mammalian cortex. And in other words, we use the model of food restriction of calorie deficit, and we were wondering how it would impact the energy usage. Would, would it decrease the energy usage to save energy? And this uh, process of saving energy, would it be at the cost of information or coding precision in the brain? For this, we used as a model system, the primary visual cortex in food restricted mice. Here you see the weight of our control mice in black and our food restricted mice in uh, red. These food restricted mice uh, would uh, lose 15% of their body weight over the course of two to three weeks. And after these two to three weeks of food restriction, we would uh, study their neuronal activity in the primary visual cortex, layer two, three, using either wall cell recordings or two photon imaging. And very importantly, we did that in sated animals because we were not interested in hunger per se or in short-term changes in metabolism, but we were interested in the effect of a long-term food restriction over the, the course of two, three weeks associated with a body weight loss. So the impact of this long-term restriction on the activity of um, cortical neurons. So in these sated animals, we performed um, first measures to study how uh, food restriction was associated with uh, a potential decrease in energy usage. Again, with the hypothesis that in response to this long-term deficit in food intake, cortical networks would save energy by reducing the ATP usage. So in order to measure the ATP usage, we first used an imaging strategy by using transgenic mice that uh, were provided by uh, our collaborator, Johannes Erlinger in Leipzig, Germany. And by using these mice, we could um, use the FRET signal by first using ATP synthesis inhibitors and then checking monitoring the decay of uh, this uh, FRET signal, both in control and food-restricted mice. And what we found is that this decay rate was reduced in food-restricted mice, indicating a reduced ATP usage. These measures were then confirmed uh, by estimating ATP usage from electrophysiological recordings. And for this, um, this uh, estimation is based on the fact that the energy expenditure for neuronal signaling is principally associated with the reversal of the sodium influx. 
via the sodium potassium ATPase for free sod sodium ion one ATP, such that if you estimate the uh, sodium influx, you can estimate the ATP usage associated to um, the reversal of the sodium influx. Okay, so this was performed in awake mice. And we first, so again, this pie chart showing the uh, energy usage, and that most of it is uh, done through synaptic transmission and apart for the action potential, it's associated with action potential. So we first checked in vivo uh, whether the spike rate um, was affected as well and the ATP, associated, the ATP usage associated with this uh, spike rate. And then we were interested in the synaptic transmission. So first the spike rate by using uh, wall cell recordings in awake mice, what stimulate, visually stimulated with uh, natural images, we could uh, record the activity of the neurons in layer two, three. And we found that actually the spike rate was maintained in the control group and in the food restricted group with no significant difference. As a consequence, the ATP usage associated with this uh, spike, spike rate was not different across groups. So we found that under the food restriction, there is less energy, but despite this uh, reduced energy available, the cortex managed to uh, maintain the spike rate. However, when then we were interested in measuring the excitatory synaptic currents using a voltage clamp, again, in the same uh, region in these awake mice, we found a decrease in this uh, mean excitatory current, corresponding to about 30% of reduction in the ATP uh, usage associated with these um, excitatory currents. And this was showing that, okay, one consequence of these food restrictions was ATP savings linked to this reduced excitatory current. We checked whether the inhibitory currents were uh, affected as well, and uh, we found that this was the case such that the excitation inhibition ratio was actually maintained between both groups. So in these food restricted mice, we have a decrease in the mean excitatory current, a decrease in the mean inhibitory current such that excitation inhibition ratio is maintained. Okay, so um, knowing that we found this decrease in vivo, we wanted to go a bit more into the mechanisms and went to in vitro recordings. Here, a slice of um, uh, visual cortex, mouse visual cortex, and uh, we found in this in vitro preparation, again, that there was indeed a decrease in the EPSC amplitude, a decrease in the empire receptor currents by about 34%. Here in the amplitude, this decreased amplitude, again, food restricted animals in red and controls in black. This uh, decrease in empire receptor currents was associated with the decrease in the empire receptor conductance. These recordings were performed with TTX, and we could confirm that these changes were due to postsynaptic changes, since these empire receptor mediated miniature uh, synaptic currents uh, were found to have a decreased amplitude, but a, a stable frequency. So there was a decreased amplitude between the control and the food restricted group, but the frequency was maintained. There was also no evidence of presynaptic changes in transmitter release based on measures of pair pulse ratio and the coefficient of variation of the synaptic responses. So we thus found in this uh, first part of the talk associated with the energy usage that the food restriction, this calorie deficit, was associated with indeed the reduction in energy usage. In vivo, we found this uh, about 30% reduction in ATP usage um, linked to the decrease in uh, mean excitatory currents. And in vitro, we found that this was mainly due to this postsynaptic effect. So despite this decrease in the mean excitatory currents, in these empire receptor currents, 
we found surprisingly that the spike rate was maintained, as I showed you in the uh, in the first slide. Um, and so we were wondering how can it be that the spike rate is maintained despite this decrease in excitatory synaptic currents? And I will show you first the mechanism and then show you how we uh, confirm that with uh, in vivo recordings. So this preservation of spike rate despite the reduction in amp receptor currents. Here you have uh, a model of a neuron. Here, the amp receptor current, the membrane potential, the spike threshold in controls. And here in the food restricted animals, as I uh, told you, there is this decrease in amp receptor current. What we found, and I will show you, is that com so compensatory mechanisms are in place in these food restricted uh, mice such that you, we found an increase in the membrane potential as well as an increase in the input resistance leading to a maintenance of the spike rate. So by this, this decrease in amp receptor current was compensated by the increase in the uh, membrane potential and the increase in the input resistance such that the uh, distance to the spike threshold was compensated and we could have a um, maintained spike rate. So we confront these mechanisms with the uh, current clamp in vivo, again, in awake mice um, watching a screen with a natural image. These are example of recordings. Here, the input resistance that was found to be increased, the membrane potential, resting membrane potential that was found to be, again, increased in the food restricted uh, mice, uh, such that the distance to the spike threshold was decreased. In the, um, in the food restricted mice and, and the, the, the spike rate maintained. So this uh, increase in the membrane potential and this increase in the input resistance normalized the spike output when the MPA receptor conductance was uh, reduced. And we used uh, a simple model integrate and fire model neuron to show that indeed when we played with this model by decreasing the uh, excitatory synaptic conductance and um, increasing uh, then the membrane potential and the input resistance, we could compensate, we could normalize the sub-threshold depolarization to the spike threshold such that when you, uh, you, you increase these two compensatory uh, variables, um, you compensate the difference um, between both groups. And this was indeed uh, what we found in our in vivo measures that this uh, no, normalized sub-threshold depolarization um, was indeed normalized across both groups, leading to the maintained uh, spike rate. So what I have shown you so far is that during food restriction, there is a save of energy um, due to this decrease in excitatory synaptic current, leading to a saving in ATP usage by about 30% and um, uh, maintain spike rate. In other words, it means that these neurons in this situation spike at similar rates as controls, but they spend less ATP on underlying excitatory currents. So the question is, is there a cost to this strategy? Because if neurons could spike at the same similar rate as controls, but spend less ATP for doing that, you could think that this could be a default strategy. Why, why isn't it the, um, the, the usual way of functioning? In, uh, for, for, for these neurons, right? Um, because indeed there is a cost, and this is a spoiler, the cost is the loss of information in the coding precision. And that's what I will show you in this um, second part of the talk. So we found that indeed these compensatory mechanisms ensure that the spike rate was maintained, um, but a maintained spike rate doesn't mean that it's the same, there is no, that the information is the same. Indeed, if we consider that um, we would, with the same number of spikes, this is a, a schemata showing that you could have the same number of spikes, but from trial to trial, 
a very highly um, reliable spiking with a spike always at the same time, for example, for this given grating, which would contain a high information, compared to a situation where you would have a high trial to trial variability with actually the same number of spikes, but um, spiking uh, uh, with much more variability and which would decrease um, the content of information associated in that case with this uh, visual stimulus. And so we went on to, to, to test this hypothesis that, okay, maybe the spike rate was maintained, but there was an increase in the noise or in the try-to-trial vari variability. And we went on to study what would be the consequences of this increase, increased trial-to-trial variability. So we first started by using, again, a, a model neuron, this Hodgkin and Huxley neuron, using one variable input source and uh, testing with this model. The advantage of the model is that we could uh, play with the different parameters and, and compare the impact of uh, increasing the input resistance, increasing the membrane potential, and uh, or both. And uh, what we found, again, so comparing the control situation with the food restriction situation, food restriction, decrease of uh, amparoceptor conductance, increase in the membrane potential, increase in the input resistance. And what we found in this model when we increased these parameters was an increase in the trial-to-trial -trial variability. And when we put both the increase of input resistance and membrane uh, and resting membrane potential, we saw a strong increase in this uh, food restriction um, case compared to control. We wanted to know if this was the case in vivo. For this, we used uh, current clamp in awake mice, watching gratings. Uh, it is known that in the primary visual cortex of mice, you have orientation selective neurons. So this is an example of a response of a neuron responding more strongly for these gratings compared to others. And um, we first checked wh what was indeed the trial-to-trial -trial reliability of these responses um, to uh, different oriented gratings. What we found, so here are some examples of recordings in control in food-restricted animals for the preferred angle, for the non-preferred angle. And what we found is indeed a um, significant increase in the trial-to-trial -trial variability in food-restricted um, animals. This increase in trial-to-trial -trial variability was associated with a broadening of the tuning curves. So when we plotted a tuning curve, so plotting the spike rate in response to the different oriented gratings, then we uh, normalize to the preferred response to the preferred orientation, plotting the tuning curves and averaging across the control mice and the food restricted mice. And you see here a broadening of the orientation tuning curve of the food restricted mice here quantified uh, by the tuning width of these uh, tuning curves that is increased in the food restricted mice with about 30% of broadening in uh, food restriction compared to controls. We checked um, whether this uh, increase in tuning width, so this broadening of the tuning curve was associated with a broadening of the subthreshold depolarization because this could have been one source. We said the trial-to-trial -trial variability could be a source explaining the broadening of the curve, but in principle, uh, broadening of the subthreshold activity could also be a source. This was not the case. You see here the recordings showing um, that for both control and food-restricted animals, the uh, normalized subthreshold depolarization was um, not different. And here, the tuning width of this subthreshold depolarization. So this broader orientation tuning in spike output was not directly inherited from the broader um, subthreshold depolarization, but indeed we uh, went further to test where it was uh, associated due to the increased um, subthreshold variability. So again, with this idea that we would have similar subthreshold depolarization, 
in both cases, but with an increase in the subthreshold variability, you would have a broadening on the spiking output, just as a, a schematic representation. So in order to um, test that, we went back to our model, the Gaussian noise model, in which uh, we, we fed into the model this uh, equivalent subthreshold depolarization for both groups, but the increased trial to trial variability. And what we found is that indeed this sort of similar subthreshold depolarization increased trial to trial variability, um, leading to a broadening of the orientation tuning curve here. And you can see here the model and here the in vivo recordings that actually led to very similar results showing this clear broadening of the curve um, associated with this increased trial to trial variability. Finally, we went back to our Hodgkin and Huxley model showing that again, when we increased the input resistance, increased um, the resting membrane potential, we increased the trial to trial variability and leading to a broadening of the orientation tuning curve. Um, notably, when we removed this variable input source, we could, uh, of course, remove the trial to trial variability. So there was no more uh, variable input source. And this actually normalized the, the tuning curve such that there was no no difference anymore uh, between control and for the restricted mice. So altogether, I hope I have shown you that we, during food restriction, less uh, calorie intake, we have a decrease of energy usage, saving energy uh, through a reduction of amperoceptive current, amperoceptor currents. The spike rate is maintained thanks to an increase in the input resistance, an increase in the resting membrane potential. But this has a consequence, meaning uh, an increase in the subthreshold variability, leading to a broadening of the orientation tuning curves. And the final question was whether this broadening of the orientation tuning curves had consequences in the coding precision and uh, impaired perception. And to test this, we uh, went back to two photon calcium imaging. So back to the usual uh, method uh, routinely used in the lab. And uh, for this, the, we image neurons uh, labeled with GKM6S. Again, awake mice in front of uh, oriented gratings. Here you have uh, an example neuron responding to these gratings with a preferred orientation at this 120 degree. Uh, we uh, confirmed that the orientation tuning curve was broader for food restricted mice compared to control. The tuning width was indeed increased. And we tested uh, whether we would also find uh, decreased in coding accuracy when we were showing natural images. So we compared the situation where we showed uh, natural images from very different environments. So this would be a very easy discrimination um, compared to uh, scenes from the same environment, which would be a very fine discrimination. It's hard to discriminate between these images. And when using a maximum likelihood decoder, to uh, we when using the activity of the layer two free neurons image with the two photon calcium imaging, and uh, from this activity we use the decoder to um, to decode which stimulus uh, had been presented to the mice, and the to infer the discriminability in this um, coarse discrimination case and here this fine discrimination case. And what we found is that for the coarse discrimination, easy discrimination, there was no difference between both groups. While for the fine discrimination, when it was hard to discriminate, then we saw a clear deficit in um, food restricted mice, such that the dec decoding accuracy was significantly lower um, in the food restricted group, indicating again a decrease in this cortical coding precision. Um, in the visual cortex. 
And we went on to know whether this uh, decrease in coding precision, so shown here in uh, the orientation tuning, through this broadening of the orientation, orientation tuning curve, or here with the uh, lower decoding accuracy for uh, fine discrimination, whether it was uh, it had some implications for um, behavior, for visual discrimination. And for this, we used um, water maze tasks, so our at least a discrimination task, visual discrimination task, but done in a big water maze that um, I will show you a movie. Yeah. So that was adapted with this um, shape divided here with two screens. And here you have a platform in front of the target screen with these vertical stripes. And the mice are trained uh, to find this uh, platform in front of this target stimulus. And once the both groups have been trained and reach a performance of uh, uh, higher than 80%, uh, we then tested these uh, mice by decreasing the angle between the target and the non-target. So at the beginning with a 30 degree difference, so it was not too difficult, but then by decreasing the difference between these two angles to 20, 10, 5, which made it very difficult to discriminate and then the control with no difference. And what we found when we tested the performance of the mice, so the percentage of the time in which they could find the, the directly the hidden platform, what we found is a decrease in the, in the performance in these food restricted mice um, when the angle difference was below 10 degrees, so below, between 10 and 5, so around 7.5 .5 degrees. Again, indicating that this food restriction results in, the, in an impaired fine visual discrimination. So what I have shown you so far is that during food restriction, we found a decrease in energy usage. Um, spike rate was maintained due to an increase in input resistance, increase of resting member potential, which led to an increase of suppression variability, a broader tuning curve, which decreased the coding precision in, in a response to natural images and had a consequence in, uh, as a decrease in the fine visual discrimination as shown in this behavioral um, test. So to, now that we, I have shown you all these uh, cortical changes associated with food restriction, one big question is what's the link between the food restriction uh, so this lower food intake and these uh, cortical changes. In other words, what's the metabolic signal linking this food restriction to these cortical changes? And um, as a first hint to uh, study that, we first uh, checked whether these changes were actually reversible. So we had this food restriction, this decrease in uh, weight, and we wanted to know whether um, these changes would be reversible when the mice would recover their weight. And this is the case. So you see here the same um, plot I had shown you at the beginning of the talk with the weights, um, the normalized weight of the mice, the control mice in black, the food restricted mice in red. Here, the two to three weeks uh, food restriction period. And here, after the end of this period, the mice uh, had ad libitum access to food, and you can see here the recovery of the weight. Uh, we used two photon calcium imaging again uh, to image layer two free neurons before and after the recovery. So, session one food restricted mice with 85% of their body weight, session two recovery when the mice recovered their body weight. And you see here the orientation tuning, broader for food restricted mice and uh, no difference after recovery. And here the quantification uh, in controls, no difference before and after, and in uh, food restricted mice before and after recovery of their body weight. So this was an indication that recovering the body weight 
uh, recovering the metabolic state would uh, reverse the cortical changes. But we wanted to, to know, okay, which metabolic signals um, were underlying uh, these, uh, these changes. And for this, we went to do a full examination of serum levels, so blood levels, of different markers, uh, metabolic markers, uh, in order to know which ones would uh, be affected in our protocol of long-term food restriction. And here you have the quantification for metabolic markers modulated by short-term societies, such as the glucose, the ketone bodies, the uh, corticosterone, and the adrenaline. And you can see that for these four markers of uh, short-term society, the serum levels in food-restricted uh, animals used for our recordings um, were actually very similar to um, the control levels here. Again, this was done in sated animals um, after two, three weeks of food restriction. However, when we change, we, we checked um, metabolic signal that was known to be associated with long-term changes um, in metabolic state, which is the leptin, here, which is a hormone secreted by adipose tissue and was shown to be uh, involved in long-term society and energy balance, we found that actually this level of uh, leptin was strongly decreased in food-restricted animals, um, similarly to uh, the decrease in cortical coding precision. So knowing that um, in our food restricted mice, again, that had lost weight, lost weight, less adipose tissue, less leptin, and less coding precision in the cortex. And we wanted to know whether um, if we would restore the level of leptin to control levels, we could restore the uh, cortical changes, this loss in visual coding precision. And the answer is yes, when we supplied leptin, we use this exogenous leptin supplementation um, to restore the leptin levels to control levels. So here again, our control mice, this is the weight. This is the food restricted animals in red and some food restricted animals that were treated with leptin for, um, for one week. And you see here the leptin levels in controls in food restricted mice and in food restricted mice with um, exogenous leptin supplementation. And we then uh, checked before and after uh, leptin or saline administration, um, whether the orientation tuning was, was changed. And what we found is that indeed this uh, exogenous leptin supplementation was um, restoring the visual coding precision here the tuning width with these oriented gratings, no change in controls, no change between the food restricted and the food restricted um, that were given saline solution. But here, the food restricted animals before and after uh, leptin supplementation with this uh, level we call recovering uh, the control levels. Here, another measure of this uh, coding precision with the natural images, checking the decoding accuracy, again in controls, food restricted, and food restricted plus uh, leptin after the leptin supplementation. Again, showing this recovery of um, coding precision with the leptin supplementation. So altogether, I think I have shown you that food restriction uh, in our model of food restriction associated with 15% 15, 15 of uh, body weight loss, we found a decrease in uh, serum leptin levels. Uh, this was associated in, at the level of the cortex with a decrease in energy usage due to a decrease in the AMPA receptor currents. The concurrent increase of input resistance and increase in resting membrane potential maintain the spike rate but uh, also increase the subthreshold variability leading to a broader orientation tuning. That was associated with a decrease in coding precision and a decrease in the fine visual discrimination. And this is 
the summary abstract <laughs> showing uh, our general conclusion that uh, I hope all the results I have shown you uh, indicate that the neocortex saves energy by reducing the coding precision during food scarcity. We had our food restricted mice, the body weight loss associated with this decrease in serum leptin. We found a decrease in ATP usage and a decrease in the coding precision that was rescued um, by the uh, leptin supplementation. And the in vivo and in vitro whole cell recordings um, could uh, showed us what were the mechanisms underlying both this decrease in ATP usage through this um, decrease in amper receptor conductance with associated with the decrease of sodium influx and a decrease in ATP uh, usage used for this uh, sodium extrusion. Compensatory mechanisms with the increase in resting memory potential, the increase in input resistance that led to uh, maintenance of the spike rate, but also to an increase of suppression variability, leading to this decrease of coding precision. So altogether, um, our results show that um, the, the brain, the cortex, the neocortex, dynamically adjusts its um, energy usage and uh, coding precision, depending on the metabolic state. So on that, I would like to thank the people who did the work. So really the driving force from the beginning to the end um, was Zaid Padamsi, uh, who is a postdoc in the lab and really did uh, all the wall cell recordings, all the in vivo imaging, except the ATP one. And yes, again, was really the star of the story. Um, the ATP measurements and the behavioral uh, test was performed by Danai Katsanevaki here. And the model, the computational uh, expert was Nathalie Dupuis here. And I would like also to, to thank the funding bodies, the Wellcome Trust, the BBSRC, the Royal Commission, and uh, the ERC. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Natalie. It was a great talk, really clear, and it's a lot of work. It's, uh, it's amazing what you've achieved. Um, so if you if you like, we may go with the questions. Yes, sure. So there are many in the in the chat. I'll try to go from the first one from from Leon Lagnado. Uh, yes. So if, is the dominant energetic cost of synaptic transmission presynaptic or postsynaptic? So um, we from so we have the evidence from in vitro recordings that it's postsynaptic. So I will go back to the side. Um, so this was checked again in vitro. Here. Yeah. So um, three lines of evidence actually. This AMPA receptor mediated miniature synaptic currents in TTX so that the amplitude was changed, but not the frequency. And also that we found that there was uh, no evidence of presynaptic changes in transmitter release based on pair pulse ratio and the coefficient of variation of synaptic responses. So mainly postsynaptic. Mainly postsynaptic, okay. Um... So then uh, we have Henrike von Helsdorf that is asking if uh, miniature EPSCs amplitude was reduced. So it seems, oh no, sorry, sorry. Um, sorry, it's, that's not a question. It was just a comment uh, to in, okay. an answer to Leon, sorry. Uh, but then we have uh, Keith Longden that is, uh, is saying, lovely work. Did you test temporal properties? Presumably responses to rapid stimulus changes were particularly affected. Sorry, I, I didn't understand. Do... Uh, so if, if, did you, uh, if you test uh, temporal properties. Oh, I see. Um, so, so whether there was a delay in the, in the response or 
did be that. So. Yeah, she, she had that comment saying, presumably responses to rapid stimulus changes are yes, yes, yes. particularly affected. Yeah. That, that, that's a very good point. We haven't tested that, but that, that's indeed a, a very good point. We don't know okay. yet. Okay, okay. Um, so then we have uh, Luisa Ramirez asking, how is the reduction percentage of ATP usage related to the calorie deficit amount? How? How is the reduction percentage of ATP usage related to the calorie deficit amount? So our model, we, we use the model of food restriction. So we have a food, res food, restriction, food restricted mice. So they have uh, less access to, to food. Right? They are food restricted. They have lost 15% of their body weight. And in, in this model, we, we are taking these mice, food restricted mice, um, and we measure the ATP usage with two ways. We use ATP imaging using uh, these transgenic mice that uh, have been used in the, the lab of Professor Herlinger. And we also estimated the ATP usage usage by using electrophysiological recordings by estimating the sodium influx. So we had these two lines of evidence showing mm -hmm. that there was this decrease in, in ATP usage. So food restriction was associated with a decreased ATP usage uh, associated with excitatory current, the decrease of excitatory current. Mm, Does see. it answer the question? And we found a, about a 30% reduction in uh, excitatory current and associated ATP usage. Yeah, I think it does. Uh, the, the, um, the same uh, same person, uh, Luisa Ramirez, asked uh, if are there diff effects observed for different calorie deficit amounts, which is something I was wondering as well. Yes. Yeah, so indeed, this this study it was uh, we we took a bit the extreme case, if you want. So it's really the model of a long-term restriction. We haven't studied the effect of short-term restriction. Uh, and we also haven't monitored the, the, the time course of the change of these changes. So when these changes appear during these two, three weeks of restriction, right? So we do expect that indeed the sh short-term uh, restriction or just a mild restriction with less uh, body weight loss uh, would lead to different to different changes or no changes or even uh, beneficial changes. So mm. um, it, it was shown that mild uh, food restriction that was not associated with uh, body weight loss could actually uh, be be beneficial for for brain functions. Okay. Uh, so we have a follow up from Liam. There is, a, there is a small delay in the chat, so... Uh, it's okay. I don't see the chat, actually, but yeah. Yeah, it's it, because it's in YouTube. Uh, the chat is in YouTube. Okay. So Leon uh, said, says that the change is postsynaptic, but he was wondering what about the energetic cost per vesicle in either condition. Um, okay, yeah. So if there would be um, a change for the vesicle, physical release, basically, I, I, I guess. Um, we haven't, so we haven't checked. That's, that would be the, the answer. I, I would think it's unlikely uh, from, from the results with the, the minis, but yeah, but, but, but we, uh, yeah, we haven't checked. But you haven't checked, okay. Okay, then we move. And also, to... Ju just to say that we 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 do find the um, well, it's not directly linked, but we, we do find similar results in vitro and and in vivo, right? So um, this decrease in the excitatory uh, synaptic currents it, it, is something both both in in vivo and uh, and in vitro. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe we can discuss. Uh, yeah. Later on. Uh, so then we have uh, Enrique von Gelsdorf this time asking that, is there a survival benefit to less coding precision in food deprived animals during evolution? Yeah, that's a, a very good point. So with the, the fly uh, study I was showing, uh, probably because it's the flies, uh, the, the researchers could push the system to 
to to artificially increase the activity of neurons in food restricted animals right so to push the system and see the impact on survival and actually the flies died uh, this is challenging in in, in mice uh, both ethically and uh, and also experimentally right because for the equivalent we would have to uh, identify which neurons are causing this decreased encoding precision, let's say precisely, then activate these neurons specifically in the range uh, that would restore the coding precision. So that's again a challenge by itself. And if when we achieve that, uh, check whether this has an impact in the um, in the survival of the mice, which uh, ethically is is is, is not uh, not possible, yes. knowing that we cannot actually go lower than uh, eighty percent of uh, their initial body weight, so twenty percent uh, weight loss. That said, uh, when we did the experiments of uh, leptin supplementation, what we we found is that when we in the group that. Uh, for which we were supplementing the leptin, we did see that these animals were uh, losing, continuing to lose weight. So we had to stop mm -hmm. again at, at this limit, but this would be an indication that, okay, if you continue to, to lose, lose weight when you artificially uh, challenge the system, but this is likely to have a detrimental effect on survival. Yeah, okay, I see. Um, then we have uh, Sylvia's rather asking, so I understand that spontaneous fading rates stay the same during food restriction, but do they change in response to visual stimuli or during curves were normalized? Yeah, yeah, sorry, this was not clear. This is the spiking rate during visual stimulation that is maintained. Okay. okay. So it's actually the spike rate during visual stimulation both during uh, presentation of uh, great things and during uh, natural stimuli. Natural images. Okay. Yes, yes. Great. So, but well, you cannot see the, the chat, but there are many comments of saying that it's a great talk, but I'll show you later. <laughs> it's nice to hear, it's nice to hear. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I think, yeah, we don't have time for many questions, but maybe for a couple more. Um, so then from Maggie Wizard, we have, uh, what would you expect to see if the mice were o overfed instead, in the case yes. of obesity? Yeah. So... May they have improved visual precision? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So we, we thought the same. We were like, well, then if you increase the adipose tissue uh, yeah. and increase the leptin, maybe we will have a highly uh, visual um, yeah, an increase in encoding precision. So um, we haven't tested. That's 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 the answer. It's unlikely to to be the case uh, since actually the the, the leptin is um, is highly regulated, and um, in the model of obesity, there is a, a the, the the leptin levels are actually uh, regulated. So you would have a down regulation of the leptin leptin signaling. Um, so. So no, we don't expect uh, that. We expect basically a saturation point in the in the coding precision. It, it will not. It's unlikely to be improved. But we haven't tested. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. We have the same question again. So where then from Sylvia is rather again. So do you know whether behavioral modulation like walking? is changed during food restriction, as you saw for invertebrates? Yes, that's a, a very good point. So actually, because you, we really wanted to go into the, 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 the cellular mechanisms, um, all our recordings were done in mice in a little tube, so they, that were not running, that could not uh, run or, or, or walk. They were like oh. in, in a tube and, okay, not not paralyzed, they, they could move a bit, but they were strongly habituated to this tube and they, they were very uh, uh, quiet um, and stationary. So we don't have the data for, for this, uh, with this, this whole data set. Um, that said, that's something we are investigating right now with uh, previous data sets from the, from the lab. 
So we would be indeed interested in knowing whether this uh, gain increase during locomotion is, is modified in food restricted mice. It could well be, um, in addition to the broadening of the, of the tuning curve. That's uh, ongoing work, yeah, it's a good point. Okay, okay. Um, well, I mean, we have just one minute, well, it's for now, but anyway, I think we have just one question, so we may go with it uh, from Maggie Wizard. Uh, through what mechanism could the change in leptin be influencing the cortical processing? Was yeah, that. yes, yes. So that's a, that's a good point. We investigate many underlying mechanisms, but there, there are still many, many questions uh, related to uh, the link between this change in this uh, uh, serum levels of the hormone, of the leptin hormone, and the cortical changes. And uh, for this, they are actually many different pathways. The leptin can pass the blood brain uh, barrier. So it could act directly on uh, neurons in the, in the visual cortex. It could also be an indirect effect um, that the leptin would actually uh, cause some changes in overbrain areas, for example, the hypothalamus that then itself would affect the cortical um, changes. Uh, finally, it could be even less, uh, less direct uh, or more indirect by affecting the levels of other hormones, for example, thyroid or uh, mm. uh, hormones that themselves then would affect cortical changes. So there are, yeah, there are many different paths through which these changes in leptin level could affect um, the cortical changes we, we see. Okay. We are investigating some of, some of its aspects. Oh, at the moment. Okay, well, great. Uh, so this is it. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, thank again. you. And, and thank you to the audience for fantastic questions and for all of, all of us to be on time. So now we will go over for further discussion in, in Zoom. Actually, I have already people joining. Uh, and... And that's it. Thank you so much. I'll leave this uh, the the chat open for a while and then close it when people join. Okay. Good. It's because like there is a delay, so if I close it now, they won't see, see. The, the the Zoom link. Yes. But I couldn't see the the YouTube right. So or the. Yeah, yeah. I didn't we... see the chat. I couldn't see the chat. I know. I know. But. Uh, um, like we said, don't open it. If you open it, don't don't put the sound on because then there is a loop and it's uh, messy. But hi, Leon. Hello. Hello, hello. We can hear you. You're muted, uh, Leon. Hey, Leon. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi, Natalie. Sorry, I singularly. V lovely talk, Natalie. I singularly failed to get my question across. No, but, no, oh, but sorry. I'm sorry. Um, no, it's okay. But actually, I'm I'm wait. I saw Simon briefly appear because yes. So, so my, you know, so, so what my question Hi, was. Hi, Simon. About, is Simon there? Hi. Yes, I am. Just Hi, trying to start Simon. my video. There we go. Hey. <laughs> nice to see Good you. See you. Yeah, it's a great talk, Natalie. Well done. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, Leon, you had a question. Well, I, I think my question might be to you as much as to uh, Natalie. So, uh, so you, yeah, Natalie, at the start of your talk, you showed this kind of uh, pie chart, the energy budget for energy costs in, in the brain. And uh, 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 you made the point that synaptic transmission was like two thirds of it. But of that two thirds, what I was wondering is how much is the presynaptic processes pumping out calcium, recycling vesicles, filling them up with transmitter versus the postsynaptic cost? So if you want to increase the energy efficiency of, of information transmission per vesicle, uh, is the best place to do it presynaptically or postsynaptically, uh, if that makes sense? Yeah. Simon, I think you. <laughs> I know. Right. Simon thought well, about this a lot. I know. In, I mean, in our budget, which is now really ancient, yeah, we just took the numbers of ions and molecules that were transferred during signalling and had to be restored. And an ion channel lets through something like a hundred thousand ions, or at least a postsynaptic set of ion channels. 
and that's a lot of ions compared with the number of calcium molecules and the number of calcium ions and the number of transmitter molecules. And so we felt that, well, our calculations showed that postsynaptic costs dominate. Okay. But a lot's going to depend on how many postsynaptic receptors you have. And there may also be costs in the presynaptic terminal that haven't been discovered yet. Yes. Yeah. So another way to answer is that by no no mean we 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 are saying that this decrease of uh, amparoceptor uh, current is is the only uh, way uh, to to save energy. That's the only the one we we tested, right? So we tested the spike rate and this uh, excitatory uh, um, amparoceptor currents, but they are. Uh, likely, very likely, over uh, mechanisms that are affected, right? Uh, to start mm -hmm. with NMDA receptors, um, but also presynaptic, uh, potentially, yeah, presyn presynaptic mechanisms. And mm -hmm. also um, cellular, cellular maintenance. Uh, I mean, many other mechanisms are likely to, to be affected. Yes. It was an entry point, basically, showing, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure, sure, you can't do everything. Yes, I mean, <laughs> of course. <laughs> no. But but I mean, but you made the point, Natalie, that the mini frequency was unchanged. Yes. But I didn't quite get if the uh, 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 number of released vesicles on average was changing. So the mini frequency unchanged. The, the, the frequency is not changed, you see. Uh, so Evoked frequency, not spontaneous. Well, minis, the minis. Yes. Yes, yes. evoked by the stimulus. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, well, I mean, so, so that's telling you there's no presynaptic modulation, really, at least in, you know, in your context. Um, that, that's what I thought, that uh, yeah, yeah. because the frequency wasn't changed, but the amplitude was decreased, that would mean that it's mainly postsynaptic. At least that's my interpretation. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I tell you what prompted this question is that uh, we've been looking at modulation in the retina, um, a different context of modulation, circadian modulation yes. in, in zebrafish. So, yes. um, and there, uh, uh, the, the, the main neuromodulator is dopamine primarily. And uh, there are profound presynaptic changes in terms of uh, uh, how efficiently a stimulus evokes vesicle release. So, um, of course, it's a different context, but, um, uh, uh, and I don't know if, it, if, there's, if there's any kind of energetic implications of it. I guess that's what I was wondering. Well, yeah. I think the thing you have Probably. to think of, Leon, is yeah. that in, um, I mean, in retinal synapses, although you've got 